Welcome to One Work, Five Questions with Donna Vitek, that is I, and Dr. Mark Holacek, that is the guy on the bottom, square or rectangle. <laughs> Wait, this isn't a math show, so I'm okay. That is he. <laughs> that is he. Um, so today's episode is Thomas Jefferson's letter to Peter Carr, dated the 19th of August, 1785. Um, but before we start, I'm going to give you Dr. Holacek's credentials, which are very important. We need to do a show on the importance of credentials uh, because I recently uncovered some information about... Credentials aren't anyway. important today. No one cares. They don't care if you have. Yeah, people. Credentials. Well, just because people don't care doesn't make it right. So um, credentials are very important if you're going to take someone's word for something. So um, Dr. Holacek is does have a PhD and he is in a professor. Something. What? In something or other. In something or other. Those are the uh, those are his attendance certificates that you see in the background um, on the wall. And he is a professor of philosophy and history who taught at institutions such as the University of Pittsburgh, University of Michigan, Rutgers University, Camden, and Ohio University. Um, he's the editor of the Journal of Thomas Jefferson and his time. And he has, what are you doing? You're distracting. Huh? Well, you're giving credentials. I'm, I'm organizing my books. Organizing your books, you can yeah, do I that have, later. I, I have a mountain of reading to do uh, on Thomas Jefferson and, you know, on, on Ukrainian uh, stuff as well. And there has to be some way of organizing, you know, I mean, when you read books, don't you put them in some order? Isn't yeah, the right order way of, to read books? You the just... order of books I'd like to read. That's about the only order I have. <laughs> okay, well... Well, Thomas Jefferson, as we're going to see in this letter, thinks that there is a an order in which you read books. And that's what we're going to see in this letter to Peter Carr. Oh, like Peter Carr. OK. It, so an order. There is some method to my madness. You figure you go ahead and work on your uh, Gordon Woods book, a good one. You go work on your credentials here and I'll finish this up well and let me know when you're done. I'll let you know when I'm done. I'll let you know when I'm done with the show. <laughs> All right. Do it without me. Hey, this is my book. I don't need to read it. Oh, send it to me. No, really? Yeah, really. That's the, got, that's the one that got me in hot water. Oh, send it to I want it. Framing a legend. I mean, oh. So we'll talk about that on another occasion, but it's a it's a good book. Yeah, yeah. But anyways, I have some credentials or others. Is that the case or something like that? Yeah, you, yeah, you have a few, quite a few credentials. Okay. And um, 23, 20, over 23 uh, or 23 published books on Thomas Jefferson. 25. 25. Yes, oh, not 23. Yeah. I, let and me I just that. finished my book on Thomas Jefferson and Native Americans today. I finished a very nice draft and enough wow. to send that out. We'll see how it happens. 20, so I changed it. Well, I, I remember when we first started, it was 20. I have it here. And then it changed Things to 23 to 25. Yeah I, yeah, I yeah, I get a lot done in a little bit of time somehow. I'm, I'm an inspiration. I'm your muse, huh? Absolutely. The muse. <laughs> For headaches. Um, and over 200 essays on Thomas Jefferson. And I highly recommend... Uh, Finding his essays, you can find them in the video description and reading them. Dr. Holacek is an excellent writer and your writing skills will improve upon reading his work. <laughs> and if you, I don't, don't, you don't believe it, just, just ask me. <laughs> they will. So with our show One Work, Five Questions, I'll ask Dr. Holacek five questions on one work of Thomas Jefferson. And our intent is to educate the American people on the work of our great founding father who wrote the Declaration of Independence. And, um, you know, we'd like the world to know more about him than just what the general public talks about. So um, we're hoping that you can enjoy the show with us today. So let's get moving. Okay. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> the introduction. Um, last week, we pledged to turn to a long overdue letter on Thomas Jefferson's moral sense. Dr. Holacek suggested a singular letter to nephew Peter Carr dated 19th of August, 1785. 
The letter gives My us a beard an manager, interest. by the way, still. Your beard Do manager. Did you get your patent on it yet? Not yet. No one seems okay. interested, but I'm plugging away. Go ahead. <laughs> Take a plug. Um, Dr. Holacek suggested a singular letter to nephew Peter Carr dated the 19th of August, 1785. The letter gives us an introduction to Jefferson's moral sense with which Dr. Holacek hopefully will explicate fully. This will be part of, of a two-part series on Thomas Jefferson and education. The second part comprising a latter letter to Peter Carr. So next week will be um, similar. It'll be another letter to Peter Carr. Um, and then the week after that will be something for the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence. Notice yes. how you said that so-and-so comprising, where everybody would say is comprised of, and they get that wrong, right? So you did it right. The letter comprising, so blah, 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 all the components of it. In other words, comprising means is composed of. People uh -huh. take comprising and uh, composing to be equivalent terms. They are not. So okay. good for you. You got comprising. <laughs> Anyways, and that's the We are there. live on Twitter spaces right now. So those of you who are watching on um, YouTube, if you want to catch the conversation live, real time, you can follow either one of us on Twitter spaces, and I'll have that information in the description as well. At Dr. Holacek, is that your Twitter handle? At at Dr. You know better than I do. I, I just start typing the D and the R, and you come up, and I click it. Okay, so, um, hey, and, that's and right. I'm uh, at Donna Vitek 1776. That's original <laughs> um, on Twitter. So you can follow one of us, and and you can listen live on um, when we record. Not your year of birth, I hope. What? Not your year of birth, I hope. Yeah. Yes, I was born in 17. I wish. I well, I wish I was born maybe 15 years prior to that. I definitely right. would have been, I would have helped in the American Revolution. All right, let's move on. I think we have like five <laughs> minutes left. Oh. <laughs> okay, question number one. Um, as usual, some background information we need. Who was Peter Carr? Uh, I can answer that somewhat briefly. Uh, he was Thomas Jefferson's nephew. This guy um, in the picture, this guy right here? Yeah, supposed to be a short, pudgy guy. A um, <laughs> lot of speculation that he was the father of some of Sally Hemings' children, and that still may be true. Um, anyways, but he was Wait, born so he was and, his nephew. He was Thomas Jefferson. Yes, he was his nephew. And Dabney Carr, who was born in the same year that Thomas Jefferson was born, right, 1743, dies in 1773. And he has six children and all. Dabney Carr is his best friend. And all the kids come to live with Thomas Jefferson, with Thomas Jefferson. But at the time, you know, males especially did not have long lives. And females oftentimes might die in childbirth. So there wasn't a great life expectancy. Mm -hmm. And Jefferson takes in all the kids. So Peter Carr becomes, in effect, Jefferson's son. Okay. And, and Jefferson takes him in. He lives with Jefferson at Monticello. Uh, he describes uh, Dabney Carr, who dies on May 16th, 1773, as the Samian sage in the tub of the cynic. The cynic being Diogenes, the Kuan, the Greek uh, famous philosopher who was known for living like a mouse, living frugally, mm -hmm. not aspiring to fame and acquisition of goods. So he respected uh, Dabney, and the, the story is, is that where the cemetery is, uh, the Thomas Jefferson Family Cemetery, there was a, an enormously large oak under which the two as young boys would sit and read books together or talk and chat about life. And they made a pact that whoever died first would bury the other in the spot. And Dabney dies, and Thomas Jefferson keeps his promise and marry, buries his friend in, you know, what he's the first person wow. in Jefferson Family Cemetery. What oh, a wow. hell, right? So he brings up Peter Carr as his own, and Peter Carr was born in January 2, 1770. This letter is 1775, so Peter Carr is a little more than 15, 15 and a half, and he's giving him fatherly advice. 
Oh, okay. Um, while he's in France, in France, seventeen eighty four. So, okay, okay. Consider oh. Peter Carr literally to be his son, in some sense. Okay, but no genetic relation. No genetic. Okay, okay. So, question number well, two. Peter Carr does marry Jefferson. Not uh, Dabney Carr does marry Jefferson's younger sister by three years. Her. Do I have it somewhere here? Uh, Who is he married? Uh, Martha Jefferson was born in 17, Jefferson's younger sister by three years. Oh. So he marries into the family. Oh, okay. So then, so Peter Carr is definitely, is genetically related to. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in effect, right. I, I, I said okay. he wasn't, but she, okay. he marries into, so let, let's correct that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Thomas Jefferson, question number two, Thomas Jefferson begins with a, a prefatory comment on the pleasantness of science, but he seems to qualify that remark by smuggling in the importance of an honest heart. Just what does he mean? Well, this, this is one of several key letters um, that Jefferson writes where he talks about how we are predominantly moral creatures and only secondary rational or intellectual creatures. That must be known. He is a moral sense theorist. There are many uh, Irish and other moral sense theorists and moral sentiment theorists, Adam Smith, David Hume, and others of his time, Lord Kames. And uh, the moral sense theorists were parasists who believed we gathered all our information through our senses. Uh -huh. And for them, the moral sense was a sensory faculty, just like my eyes, my ears, my faculty of tactility. And um, we, would in effect um, um, gather information in that way, uh, you know, but through our senses, and I'll explain that in a bit. But the idea here is he says, um, he says, uh, science is a pleasing employment, all right, to be in the letter. I can assure you that the possession of it is. What, next to an honest heart, will above all things render you dear to your friends and give you fame and promotion, right? Science is great, learning and knowledge and all that, but it's second to an honest heart. He says, when your mind shall be well improved with science, nothing will be necessary to place you in the highest points of view, but to pursue the interests of your country, the interests of your friends, and your own interests also with the purest integrity, the most chaste honor. So in other words, when I acquire knowledge, it's not a matter of having knowledge. It's a matter of using it in the interest of your country, your friends, and yourself. Sharing that knowledge. And that's what this show is about, too. We haven't right. talked about what right. we do with here. Is we're sharing knowledge. I've always said, you know, right. I have some information on Thomas Jefferson up here. A little bit. And I'm trying to share it. Well, maybe a little bit. But, I, you know, the idea is to share it. Right. How good is to take it to the grave, Right. That's why I write right. books as well. He says the de you know uh, this will the defect of these virtues can never be made up by all the other acquirements of body and mind. Give up money, give up fame, give up science, give up in other words knowledge. Give the give the earth itself in all it contains rather than do an immoral act. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it is much more important to be a moral person than it is to be a smart person. Because right. brains without a sense of morality takes you nowhere. Right. Our political system is based on some measure of brains without morality. That, that's how our, our system works. But. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, question number three. How exactly does the moral sense work? Well, um, like I said, it's a sensory faculty. We talked to this a little bit, and the idea is to tease this out in subsequent, uh, this in subsequent uh, uh, programs. But I feel, right? He talks in, in the 1786 October letter to Maria Cosway. He says, it's a sensory faculty. My eyes, right, are the organs of seeing. Take out the eyes I don't see. Uh -huh. He suggests in the letter that the heart is the organ of morality. Take out the heart and you have no morality. But of course, you take out the heart, you have not much of anything. So <laughs> hard to test that hypothesis. Let's remove the heart from a person and see if he well, loses his sense of morality. 
it's not the literal heart. So I, I'm, I'm no, guessing. No, I think he means literally the heart. Oh, okay. Okay. He's talking about moral sense and senses have organs, right? My, I hear through my ear. Mm -hmm. I feel through my skin, right? I taste and stuff through my mouth. Mm -hmm. All uh, uh, faculties have corresponding material organs. So okay. I take I really take him seriously when he thinks that the organ of morality is the heart. There are moral sentiment theories just say that morality is a matter of feeling right. and they don't relate it you know, to like David Hume, don't relate it to any organ, but Jefferson is not a moral sentiment theorist. He's a moral sense, and senses have corresponding organs. Okay. So I take in, so in other words, I feel likely through my heart or some other mm -hmm. organ, the right course of action. And when I okay. feel that course of action, uh, I, I act in accordance with that action, right? Right. Okay. Um, it is a matter of, uh, he says, uh, you know, so I feel it. And intellect is not involved. This is a lot of people, Adrian Koch and Gene Yarbrough and other people who write well on this topic, get mm -hmm. wrong. They think that the, the intellect is the, the final decisive factor for Jefferson. It is not. Right. Jefferson is clear on that. The letter 1814, the Thomas Law and other letters, it works independently of reason. I know the right thing to do. Reason, when it does interfere, usually screws things up, like peer pressure and things, telling me that I shouldn't do what I ought to do. Right. Right. So reason is a corruptive faculty when it comes uh, to, but oftentimes, he does say sometimes reason can come to the rescue. Like when I look at certain habits, say, of Native Americans that are morally retrogressive, right? You just can't go into a native nation and say, you know, what you're doing is wrong. Right. <laughs> They're not going to. You need to have a certain tolerance. And this is where reason can rescue morality. Look at slavery. Jefferson knew slavery was wrong, but there's a right time. You can't go out and say, OK, I know slavery is wrong. Let's act on it right now. People always say he didn't act on it. Well, precipitous action can have morally deleterious, morally egregious, whatever that word means consequences and he knew that what happened during you know presume that the civil war was at least in part through about slavery mm -hmm. you know and that's true it was at least in part uh to act on something before its time can have really bad consequences look mm -hmm. at how the economy of the south was crippled in the civil war uh so he says it so it's a feeling so how do you go about how do you feel it well you just feel it he he says here um Whenever you're about to do a thing, though it can never be known, but to yourself, ask yourself how you would act with all the world looking at you and act accordingly, right? So in other words, if I'm in a situation, I want to know, should I do? And I have a feeling this is the right thing to do. How do I know? How do I verify that? Right. Pretend everybody could watch you. Imagine you want to do something somewhat egregious in your own house, right? You want to send a nasty email. To somebody who hurts you or something like the emails you send me every morning just teasing you. Uh, but imagine you want to send it i want to send a nasty email to someone someone hurt yeah. my feelings and i'm gonna say oh i'm gonna let you give it to this person yeah well, you know it, it, you feel sort of well yeah i can get away with this i'm gonna hurt the person but imagine everybody in the world could watch you could get inside your mind thinking and follow your course of thought right are you gonna send that email Yes. <laughs> well, you, okay. All right. Well, Jefferson thinks so. In another letter, he says, imagine Peyton Randolph, George With, or, or William Small, his professor at William <laughs> Mary. He says, sometimes when I'm about to think about what to do, I imagine these people are behind me and watching me. Uh, so in other words, I know what is right or wrong. And sometimes I become dissuaded to do right. the right or wrong thing because of some sort of other conflicting feeling or some reasoning, right, right. that corrupts me. Uh, but just forget about that. Pretend all the world is watching or pretend someone, you know, some some great, right? Uh, but the, the moral sense is like any other faculty. It needs exercise. Right. This is exercise, yeah. the moral faculty, when the opportunity arises, they will gain strength by exercise as a limb 
of the body does, and that exercise will make them habitual. So it's one thing to know, you know, like I want to work my bicep. It's one thing to know that um, it's something is right to do. It's another to do it. Right. How many people say, yeah, I know that's right. I don't feel like giving blood during the time of crisis is the right, but I don't feel like driving there and then, you know, having to give the blood. Someone sticks a needle in me. Um, so I don't feel like doing it. So the idea is it needs encouragement from appropriate authorities, people that, this is why he reads the New Testament. Um, he gets encouragement from Jesus saying this or that, or ancient right. philosophers talking about doing the right thing. And it sort of reinforces in you. And yeah. if you hang around the right people, when you do the right thing, they're going to tell you you've done the right thing as a young boy, and you'll keep wanting to do the right thing. So, um, you know, that, that's that there. I mean, does that help? I mean, so it's, it's a feeling. Yeah. It's, not a feeling. It's, not, it's not an intellectual process. <laughs> Question number four. How does the moral sense interact with reason and the aesthetic sense? So we have three, you know, I don't know if you have, I sent you a couple of books, but I have a book on Thomas Jefferson, Moralist, right? Mm -hmm. The only book on Jefferson's moral sense mm -hmm. and morality. And I have a book on Jefferson, just came out, Jefferson Taste in the Fine Arts. Mm -hmm. And there I talk about taste is the aesthetic sense. So we have these three faculties, the moral sense, which deals with morally correct action feels, the aesthetic sense, which is another feeling faculty, and he doesn't really say much about that anywhere. So that has to be teased out. And I think I do a good job of that, which is independent of the moral. Then there's intellect. All three, I know, all three are, um, are involved in my daily activities. Now, the moral sense and the aesthetic sense seem to work together neatly, even though they're independent. In other words, knowing what the right thing to do is not the same as knowing that something is beautiful or not, but right. they work well. When I see someone, you know, helping, you know, uh, uh, an elderly person walking trips on the sidewalk and falls down, and I see someone come and assist the person back onto her feet, I or his know feet, I, or his feet, whatever. Hey, females, elder females fall down too. But I, I help the older woman to her feet. I not only, you know, when I watch this, I not only feel something good. Mm -hmm. I feel, I can feel, boy, that was the right thing to do. I also have a sense of beauty to it. That not only the right thing to do was good, but it was beautiful. Right? So in some sense, morally correct action works with this independent faculty, the aesthetic sense. And uh, but it doesn't work so much with reason. And we, we talked about to um, explicate, as you said, or uh, expiscate, as I like to say, fish out. Right. Um, when he says, imagine you are in a like this past. So imagine he goes, you know, the moral sense is not a perfect faculty for complex situation and, and, and some moral uh, scenarios are highly complex right mm -hmm. highly complex um now how do you know what the right course of action is and he said you don't always know because the path towards where you're at to where you need to go is unclear you can't right. see it you can't feel it but you do know you might feel that this first step is correct Mm -hmm. Not know it, feel it. So you take that first step. And then you can feel that this is the correct second step, and then third, and so forth. But what guides you all along is uh, is lack of mendacity, is truthfulness, is honesty, guilelessness, mm -hmm. right? It, it's just being, you know, pursuing what is what is true and honest all the time, an estimate in Latin. Uh, let me read what he says here. If ever you find yourself environed with difficulties and perplexing circumstances out of which you are at a loss how to extricate yourself, do what is right and be assured that that will extricate you the best out of the worst situations. Though you cannot see 
when you take step one, what will be the next? Yet follow truth, justice, and plain dealing, and never fear they're leading you out of the labyrinth in the easiest possible manner. So you take, follow truth, you take the first step, right? Avoid dishonesty, in other words. Right. Right. And then you may not know, but as long as every step, it's like a math proof, right? If I don't know how to get from the problem to the solution, I take the first step. And if the first step is deductively sound and my reasoning is sound, I know that that step is right. Then I take the next step, reevaluate it. I know that sound. Before you know it, you you solve the proof because each step is foolproof. Right? Um, talked about leading out, out of labyrinth is the not what you thought a Gordian one will untie itself before you. The Gordian knot is the famous knot Alexander the Great faced, where there was presumably this unbreakable knot tied so tightly no one in the world could untie it. Mm -hmm. According to once probably Quintus Curtius Rufus, Alexander was faced with the knot and and he uh, they said, well, let's see if the great Alexander can untie the Gordian knot. And Alexander took his sword and cut it and he untied the knot that way, which is not really untying it, but it's an Alexander way of solving the problem. That's what we mean by Gordian knot. It's a knot that can't be untied. Okay, a couple more lines here. Nothing is so mistaken as the supposition that a person is to extricate himself from a difficulty by intrigue, by chicanery, by dissimulation, by, by holding back information, by trimming, by an untruth, by an injustice. This increases the difficulties tenfold, meaning mm -hmm. it decuples it mm -hmm. tenfold. There's the word for the day. And those who pursue these methods get themselves so involved at length that they can turn no way, but their infamy becomes more exposed. It is of great importance to set a resolution, not to be shaken, never to tell an untruth. There is no vice so mean, so pitiful, so contemptible. And he who permits himself to tell a lie once finds it's much easier to do a second and third time till at length it becomes habitual. Then he lies without thinking about it and his whole soul, his whole moral faculty becomes a tortured web of lies. It's a very beautiful passage. It, um, yeah, that was my favorite part of the letter, I have to say. <laughs> well, scholars do not pay much attention to that. They think, oh, this is some guy preaching to his nephew, but of course he didn't live that way. I think he lived most of his life. Uh, when he dealt at president, there was some dissimulation. I don't think he ever went out of his way to tell a lie. He always went out of his way to avoid a lie. He did dissimulate at times. I, I can give you instances of that. They need not concern us, but I think he was a highly, highly moral person. And I take right. this, I take passages like this seriously. Right, right. Kind of cool stuff, isn't it? Yes, very cool, very cool. I enjoyed it. Um, question number five. Okay, Thomas Jefferson then turns to a course of reading. Um, it is a fairly detailed course and one to be adapted um, to uh, present situation only. What is the course of reading and what of Thomas Jefferson's qualifying remark? Well, this goes back to my sorting out my books, right? How do I put the books in order? How do I know what book to read next? Uh, I'm not going to go completely into this, but Jefferson had a plan for a young male Virginian's education that, enti that entailed what to read, when to read it. Wow. Right? In what order of the day to read such and such book. Oh, even the order of the day. Wow. He was nuts. Well, he the mind is fresh in the morning. So you tackle some yeah. of the larger problems. Yeah. And then you turn to uh, less difficult things like oratory later in the day. Right. So remember, Peter Carr is 15. And in my book, Thomas Jefferson and Education is political uh, philosophy of education. Um, Jefferson thinks that the first level of education is, you know, elementary reading, writing, arithmetic, and things like that, grammar. Uh, uh, then at the highest level, there's college education, right? like the University of Virginia. Right. We, we, he doesn't call it college. College for him is the second level or the grammar schools. But in between the two, what do you do? Here we have colleges or grammar schools. 
And Jefferson means by that, well, you, you, the mind is in a strange place. Uh -huh. You're not quite old enough, maybe 16, where the mind is sufficiently mature, where you can uh -huh. tackle subjects with moral implications like religion. Right. right. No religious instruction at all in this letter. He does not believe in giving children religious instruction until the rational faculty is old enough. So when we get to 1787 letter, he's going to talk. He Peter Carr is 17 at the time, and he's going to give him advice on religious instruction because his mind is old. Mm -hmm. Here he's just giving him an education at the college or grammar school level between elementary and high level education. You start off with ancient history, reading about the Greeks. In about English people talk, then you go into Roman history, right? Uh, then you go to modern history, right? The idea behind studying history, because it's very easy to read history, you can read it in Greek and in Latin, right? Uh -huh. And if you have old English, you can do that, but you can read it in the original language. It's very easy to assimilate and it gives you morally encouraging lessons, Tacitus. Right in in other Greeks, uh, Suetonius, Cicero's uh, uh, letters and morally uh, moral writings. You can you can get morally enhancing information and learn about the past as well. Mm -hmm. So you're reading predominantly, studying languages and you're reading history. Then he says, uh, give yourself a break. You know, to exercise. Right, a strong body makes a strong mind. As to the species of exercise, it's kind of weird. He's going to say, I advise the gun. Right? While this gives a moderate exercise to the body, it gives boldness, enterprise, and independence to the mind. Don't play with ball games. He says, games played with the ball and others of that nature are too violent for the body and stamp no character on the mind. Oh, wow. Let your gun, therefore, be your constant companion in your walks. Never take a book. Thinking is put aside, is in abeyance at the time, right? Wow. Never allow yourself to think. So you say, take your gun. Are you hunting? That's not necessarily. You're going for a walk in case, right. you know, you meet a bear or something. You have your gun with you. But just get out into the wild and free your mind. The oh, mind wow. So that was a, that was an ad, he was advocating for, for carrying your. Yeah, yeah. A friend of mine, Arthur Scher, has a great uh, essay on Jefferson and guns. Jefferson owned anywhere from four to five guns. He did hunt at times. He was a, he, he, you know, if he saw a bird sitting on a post, he wouldn't shoot it. He would shoo it first before he tried to shoot it. Right. So he wanted to give the animals a sporting chance. So right. uh, it was common for people to hunt at the time. And he was a gun owner. He was decently good with his gun. <laughs> okay. um, and, and people at the time in his day hunted. You know, you can okay. you can kill a deer or something and, and get extra meat for your, you know, um, can't say he did this all the time because he was so involved in political matters. But and then he says, take a walk for a half hour in the morning when you first rise, this shakes off sleep and things like that. <laughs> all right. Then he, I'll add this, leave off. He says, the, the plan I propose to you is adapted to your present situation only. Learn French, learn Spanish. French is important because a lot of the books you need to read will be in French, especially math books. Right. Spanish is an up and coming language. He says your present situation, you're not old enough for me to give you more detailed advice, which he does two years later. Okay, and I, I think that pretty much all I want to say about your last question. That's all I wanted to say about that. <laughs> okay, so um, next week, we'll follow up with Thomas Jefferson's prescription for a proper male education for a Virginian gentleman with his 1787 letter to Peter Carr. That's the letter you were just referring to that was written two years later. Mm -hmm. um, the focus here will be on the religious education. Ooh, can you give us a teaser about that? Well, let me play with that. I mean, he, uh, no one knew anything about Thomas Jefferson's religiosity by the time of his death, not even people in his family, which is, you know, strange. Yeah. Uh, that he constructed his own Bible by cutting out passages from the New Testament, getting rid of the right. miracles and all the stuff. People didn't know about that until he died. Wow. And he was perfectly consistent with 
He didn't care to let people know what his religious beliefs were. He shied away from that, not because necessarily he was afraid. He was in some sense afraid because his views were a bit eccentric. You right. know, they weren't canonical. They weren't, you know, just like most of the Christians would be read the Bible, everything in the Bible is true. But he just thought religion was such a personal thing. It was wrong for, and people disagreed so violently about different personal religious beliefs. It was wrong to try to influence people. Okay. So, you know, when he gives his nephew religious advice, he's not going to reveal what his own views are. But he's going to give Peter Carr a number of options. options. For oh, good. This or that or that. And some of these options are things that Jefferson never really seriously considered. So it's really quite an astonishing letter by an astonishing person who, as I've said before, was, regardless of what people say, devoutly religious. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very important sense of religious. Hmm. Yeah. I, th I think we've talked about that. That was one of our first episodes that we did. Um, so those of you who are joining today, if you would please um, like and share this video, subscribe to our channels. Um, you can find Dr. Holacek uh, on YouTube as well. Subscribe to his channel, subscribe to my channel. And um, the most important thing is to like and share the information. Um, you never know who's out there who may want to learn something <laughs> new about Thomas Jefferson. Um, if you'd like to have Dr. Holacek uh, make an appearance at an event, you can contact him at mholacek at hotmail.com or his Twitter at Dr. Holacek. Um, and his, or his Facebook page, Thomas Jefferson, bring him home to Monticello, Citizens for Change um, is another way. And or also, or if, you, if you like to bring Jeffy the Wonder Dog to your event, he's a lot more expensive than I am. I'm just warning you. Oh, Jeffy, I want to bring. Yeah. <laughs> I want Jeffy. How much he does heard it cost? his he heard his name. Look at him. Hi, Jeffy. Oh my gosh, he's so cute. I want him. I how much do I have to pay? And you'll send well, him here. Well, I have to discuss that with him. I I want it, Jeffy. It depends. It depends on the venue. It depends on my the house. Venue. <laughs> if it's a highly politicized venue, he's really, really uh, extraordinarily expensive. If does he come? Does he wear the, a white wig? Can't tell you how he's going to dress. He, <laughs> I don't even know. He's his own. He's his own person. He's his own dog. Oh, he's so precious. He makes my. He makes the show. I just. I like doing the show just so I can see Jeffrey every week. <laughs> oh, he's so cute. Oh my gosh. He he wants daddy's attention. <laughs> okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you for those on Twitter spaces for popping in. I appreciate your time and attention that you're giving and to please the show. Comment, uh, please ask questions or comment on the show and we'll address yes. them if you can. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Halestad. That's up for now. Okay. Bye-bye.